morning. My name is Marco Rochini, and I'm a first year PhD student in fracture mechanics at Imperial College London. The work which I'm going to present you today concerns the fatigue and fracture resistance of 316 stainless steel with prior kick damage. Let's have a quick look at the outline. We'll start with a brief introduction on the importance of the mind the material fracture resistance. We'll move on discussing about the global technology method, and afterwards, we'll talk about the performance of fatigue rate growth and fracture toughness test. So, as you may know already, Type 316 stainless steel is widely used in advanced gas cool reactors, high temperature operated components. Uh, these kind of components experience inelastic damage, which weaken the components' properties and may lead to the components' failure during its working life. Inelastic damage is a combination of plastic strain, which is due to the manufacturing process, and creep damage, uh, which arises during the components' operation. Uh, therefore, the study of the inelastic damage effects on the structural integrity of high temperature operating components is crucial and plenty of work has been done in this direction by performing all kinds of fracture mechanics tests such as uh, fatigue crack growth, creep crack growth and fracture toughness test. And the materials have been tested in several states uh, which are the has received, uh, pre-compressed, locally grip damaged and globally grip damaged. In this work we focus our attention on the globally grip damaged material. So uh, the material can be globally grip damaged by performing a global grip test which consists in performing a uniaxial trip test on a large block of material in order to achieve a certain amount of trip damage which is globally and uniformly distributed within the material. In the performed case study conducted by Dr. Memon Paras, uh, a large block of 316 h has been firstly pre-compressed to 8% plastic strain in order to limit uh, the plastic strain during the loading up of the samples in the subsequent crisp test. Uniac circuit test, which has been conducted at 550C and 300 megapascal applied load. And the test has been interrupted when an instantaneous creep strain rate of around twice the minimum creep strain rate has been achieved. After test interruption, standard size CT samples have been manufactured from the code region of the material. And uh, afterwards, uh, a room chapter through fatigue crack road uh, test has been performed by Dr. Memamparas on uh, these samples. And finally, Nine half-size CT samples have been manufactured and reconstructed from the standard size broken out samples. Just to clarify what I will show you later on, here you can see the test matrix uh, reporting all these specimen dimensions. Uh, the first five samples highlighted by the black frame and named CT25 are the five half-size CT samples employed in this work. Three of them underwent the fatigue crack road test, while the other two underwent the fracture toughness test. So, prior to perform the test, an assessment of the material state has been made. And as you can see from the picture on the left, sorry, as you can see on the picture from the left, on the left, uh, some micro cracks along the green boundaries have been found. And moreover, some creep damage in the form of voids and micro cracks have been also observed as depicted from the picture on the right. Finally, an assessment of the material's hardness has, has revealed an average because hardness of around 200 HV, showing no substantial changes when compared and undamaged material. So let's start from the fatigue crack road test. Three room temperature fatigue crack road tests have been performed following the standard ASTM E647. And in order to be consistent with previous tests, a stress ratio R of 0.1 has been chosen and also a frequency of 10 hours has been chosen. And finally, the elastic alloy compliance technique has been employed for measuring the instantaneous crack length during the test. Moving to test results, here you can see the normalized crack length A over W plotted versus the number of cycles. Uh, we should focus our attention on the crack incubation period, because as you can see, it's clearly shown by the graph how in all the three performed case studies, the crack needed uh, several number of cycles to start propagating, roughly between 12 and 30 percent of the number of cycles of failure. Uh, on the other hand, although the final normalized crack length are quite similar, the number of cycles to reach the failure are different one from the other. But despite this, however, in all the performed case studies, the crack exhibits uh, an accelerated crack growth towards the end of the test. Moreover, <coughs> the crack growth rate per cycle has been plotted versus the stress intensity factor range on a log log graph, as you can see from this picture. And the obtained result from the GCD material have been compared with the ones previously obtained from the pre-compressed, from the standard size CT samples. So as you can see, results are quite consistent and a good agreement with the pre-compressed materials is shown. 
as is also confirmed by the magnitude of the Paris low equations constants, which are summarized in the table as I depiction. So, moving on to the fracture surface testing, two room temperature room fracture surface test of meter four, following the ASTM E1820 standard. Uh, prior to perform the test, the specimens have been side grouped in order to promote the state front tic-tac-tac growth during the test. And moreover, the specimens have been briefly cracked to a uh, normalized crack length A over W0.5 in order to introduce sufficiently sharp crack teeth and to meet the test standards criteria. Uh, finally, as previously done for the fatigue crack growth test, the elastic and loading compliance technique has been employed in order to measure the crack length during the fatigue free crack. Once again, coming on to test results, here you can see the obtained fracture resistance cores from the GCD material and also a comparison from the ones previously obtained from the locally deep damage, the pre-compressed and the acid received material. So it's quite clear from the picture as the globally deep damage material shows an overall reduction of the fracture energy release rate J and this can be due to the reduction of the tensile strain of failure of the material due to the grip damage and moreover the pre-compression increases the least stress of the material contributing to the reduction of the fracture energy J. So post-testing, some high-resolution pictures of the fracture surface have been taken in order to measure the crack length straight on the fracture surface and to make an assessment of the compliance reliability. As you can see from the percentage errors summarized in the tables under the pictures, uh, the compliance has revealed to be uh, quite reliable in uh, predicting the instantaneous crack length with uh, errors between 0 and 10%. So, to conclude, we have seen how plastic pre-compression and cyclic pre-strain have shown no significant influence on the fatigue crack growth behavior of the material at room temperature. On the other hand, the enhancing deformation and damage have resulted in a reduced fracture energy uh, due to the reduction in tensile activity of the pre-strain material. A few other work concerns the <coughs> testing of the samples, the half-size samples at high temperature by performing pre crack growth tests. And moreover, a second large block of 316H will be globally kick damage and standard size CT will be manufactured from this large block in order to study deeper the high temperature behavior of the material. Just before concluding, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Memaparas for sharing this test data on the standard size CT employing this work. And moreover, I would like to thank EDF Energy for funding my PhD, pro PhD project and for the provided material. Finally, I thank you for your attention. So, thank you. Thank you.